So this is Congressman Rod Blum. Hi, uh, everybody. Uh, he's a member of the Freedom Caucus, and uh, he's doing a lot of great work in, in uh, D.C., one of the few people who actually does what he say he's says he's going to do in Washington, which I find completely refreshing. Like I was saying before, we, we were talking a little bit about a lot of the exit polls in the in this past election said that 76 percent of, uh, of voters thought that the media was actually more interested in making money than than actually telling the truth. So. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think there's a, I think there's a certain amount of truth to that. Uh, I think the polls, if we're going to talk about polls, have said uh, over the last three or four months that an uh, uh, overwhelming majority of Americans do not trust the major media. And uh, I think a big part of the reason is uh, I'm 61 years old, and I've never seen the media so in the tank for a presidential candidate as they were for Hillary Clinton. Uh, I've never seen the media attack a presidential candidate like they did uh, Donald Trump. And I think America uh, realizes that now and, and recognizes that. And uh, as mm -hmm. I said, the overwhelming majority of Americans uh, do not trust, you know, the mainstream media. Absolutely. That's yeah. why I'm, I'm personally glad there's uh, alternative uh, media, especially social media, uh, just like you're doing. I think yeah. it's great. <laughs> and uh, yeah, to, to get to get the to get the the truth out there and uh, and get the facts out there. Um, you know, we don't, I don't, I don't like it when the talking heads say, here's, here's how you should interpret what you just heard. Yeah. Here's how you should interpret what this candidate just said. It's like, no, just tell me what the candidate said yeah. and I'll interpret myself Absolutely. and I'll, I'll, I'll draw my own conclusions yeah. of what they said. People are, yeah, people are smart enough, smart enough to figure that out on their own for the most There's part. There's saying think. that, you know, the comic, the comic pages in the newspaper are for people uh, who uh, can't read and the opinion pages are for those people that, that don't think. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it's just like, yeah, just, just report the news, major media, please. Just absolutely. report it. Yeah, absolutely. We'll draw our own conclusions. Absolutely. Well, hey, um, you know, for some, some of the people in, in my audience who may not be super familiar, um, what are some of your big initiatives in Congress, and what are you hoping to do now that you've won re-election? Well, they, they remain the same. Uh, when I ran two years ago, I always told people, if you, uh, if you want more of the same, if you like the direction the country's heading two years ago, uh, if, you, uh, if you want the ruling class, the political class, the career politicians, in Washington uh, to tell you how to run your small business or run your life, mm -hmm. vote for my opponent. If you want somebody that's going to go to Washington, D.C., to uh, uh, that believes in the power of the individual versus the power of government, if you want somebody that's going to try to give you back some liberty and some freedom that's been uh, taken from you by the government, uh, if you want somebody that will stand up uh, to the special interest groups and stand up to my own party. I'm a Republican, and uh, I stood up to the Republican Party, then yeah. send me. And they sent me, and it's exactly uh, what I did. And you said in the intro here that uh, I've actually I actually did what I said I would do. Yeah. And my first vote was against the uh, then Speaker of the House, John Boehner, mm -hmm. because that's why I promised people in my district I would do is uh, I would vote for change there in my own party. So I have stood up to my own party, uh, voting against the Speaker uh, at the time, John Boehner. I voted against the bipartisan Budget Act because mm -hmm. it blew through the uh, spending caps. I voted against the sure. omnibus in 2015 because it blew through the spending caps mm -hmm. uh, against my own party's wishes. Yeah. And uh, But then conversely, I've also, uh, when it makes sense for Iowa in my district, uh, you know, I voted for the education bill. I voted mm -hmm. for the surface transportation bill, which is the highway bill. I voted for the 21st Century Cures Act, which adds another 8 to $9 billion in funding for research and development mm -hmm. uh, to uh, find cures for diseases like Alzheimer's and cancers. So uh, the bottom line is I own my voting card. I haven't turned it over to the Republican Party. I haven't turned my voting card over to special interests. Uh, the voters of Eastern Iowa own my card, and uh, I always vote what's in the best interest of Eastern Iowans and then what's in the best interest of Americans. And uh, I don't march to anybody's drum in Washington, D.C. Sounds good. So you'd say fiscal conservatism is, is one of your, uh, one of your biggest, uh, biggest focuses in Congress? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we need, we need more of that. Uh, we're, we're approaching $20 trillion, with a T, in debt. Uh, our annual interest is about uh, $260 billion a year. We're spending in, in interest payments at record low interest rates. When interest yeah. rates normalize, when they normalize, they go back to 4 or 5%. Uh, federal government's interest bill will be six, $700 billion at the current amount of indebtedness. Mm -hmm. uh, that's frightening. So that would, that would be the that biggest uh, portion of the budget that it would be allocated well, to, I mean, right? Uh, just to put in perspective, mm -hmm. we spend around $700 billion a year on Social Security. Mm -hmm. We spend about... 900 billion a year on defense so we'd be spending almost that much on okay. interest alone yeah. uh this year our uh, deficit uh us uh, is uh 590 billion 600 billion dollars in a year and it's never mentioned i mean yeah. I, I bet your average citizen does not 
realize yeah. that it's never mentioned. It wasn't. It wasn't hardly mentioned in the debates. And uh, as uh, Admiral uh, Admiral uh, Mullen said, mm -hmm. who was the chair, former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, when asked what was the biggest threat to America, mm -hmm. he didn't he didn't name a foreign country. He said the biggest threat to America is our debt. And Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. You know, mo most great civilizations, most great countries crumble from within, <clears throat> and we've seen that over through history. America is heading to a bad place until unless we get this debt and spending under control. Uh, and, and I just think it's immoral what we're doing to our children and grandchildren, putting this kind of debt on their backs. And, and what it does is a drag on the economy, yeah. uh, having this much debt. And we can see now our economy is growing at 1% this year. And average is about 3.5%. Mm -hmm. In fact, this is going to be the first president in United States history, in U.S. history, going back to George Washington, that has not had a single year of GDP <laughs> growth, greater real GDP growth, greater than 3%. We haven't had one in the last eight years. And this is why people's wages are stagnant. This mm -hmm. is why working families in the middle class in this country are not getting ahead. They're falling behind because our economy is subpar. So Absolutely. we need to reignite the economy. And but one of the one of the solutions is to get our spending under control. Would there uh, be something that an omnibus bill would have to look like for it to get the Rod Blum stamp of approval? Like what would that entail? Well, you know, it's like, uh, well, the, the total, the spending, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the spending caps. Uh, we uh, blew through the spending caps last year, and uh, I think you know I think I think Americans I hear it all the time. I know Americans, Eastern Iowans say you know we got to quit this hemorrhaging of spending at the federal level and the, the debt we just talked about three minutes ago, uh, and this this is where it happens. And this is how it happens. Uh, I don't like omnibus bills. It's bad government. Uh, what they do is they roll all of the twelve spending bills into one bill. It's multiple thousands of pages mm -hmm. long. It has lots, thousands of great ideas in it and good things, and probably thousands of bad things in it, and you get a yes vote or a no vote. Mm -hmm. And as members of Congress, we don't have a line item veto, and neither does the president. Yeah. So we can't go through there and pick and choose. So we just get one vote on this, yes mm -hmm. or no. And uh, that's bad government. I, I yeah. don't like that. And uh, we need to stop that. And Speaker Ryan Absolutely. agrees. And so going forward in the next session, um, I look forward to debating in an open and transparent way the 12 spending bills that we need to approve every year in Congress and uh, being able to offer amendments and vote each one of them up or down as opposed to a multiple thousand page omnibus. Uh, so uh, uh, well, I'll just look at the total, the total spending and we'll see where that's at. And, sure. You know, like I said, there's bound to be thousands of great ideas in it, good yeah. things and thousands <laughs> of bad things in it. Yeah. And you just got to look at it overall. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, we'll also see what president elect Trump has to say. Sure. Uh, we have a, we have a new leader. New yeah. sheriff in town. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, Speaker Ryan was the highest-ranking Republican, and now it's uh, uh, President-elect Trump. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what he says about uh, the omnibus bill. If he gives it a thumbs-up or thumbs-down, that, sure. that will weigh in my decision as well. All right. Um, so you would say you'd, you'd much rather uh, you know debate the individual 12 different spending bills than just the massive omnibus that we've had? This coming legislative session, starting here in 2017, mm -hmm. will be uh, uh, going through the appropriations bills for 2018. Because uh, this omnibus is going to cover 2017. Uh, we need to do it the right way. We need to get yeah. back to what's called regular order. And that's good government. I always say it's worked for 240 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to get back to it. Because sure. it works. And uh, we just need to follow the rules. Sure. So basically just Congress doing its job then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, Harry Reid in the Senate, uh, he, uh, you know, he, he, he blocked bringing these things up. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we did go. We, the House passed, I think, five appropriations bills. And uh, the Senate never really took them up, so because uh, they know uh, they will, they what they typically want it all in one bill yeah. and have an up or down vote, uh, and uh, that's what they prefer. But now uh, I hope uh, President Elect Trump mm -hmm. says let's get back to regular order and do them individually. Sure, it matters a lot who's in the White House. It matters a lot. Oh yeah, for sure. Who would you say are some of your uh, key allies in Congress, and and who do you think is someone you've always wanted to collaborate with? Oh, I have many. Uh, I mean, first thing that comes to mind is our Iowa delegation, uh, as far as key allies. Uh, so Senator Ernst, Senator Grassley. Uh, obviously, if, if there's anything like the word of bill, the Cedar Rapids flood wall project, um, th those are my first calls mm -hmm. to those two senators. And then, uh, you know, the uh, Iowa delegation, uh, uh, Congressman Young, uh, Congressman King, and Congressman Lobsack. Uh, we, we all get along great. And, uh, you know, Dave Lobsack's a Democrat, and I get along with yeah. Dave just, just wonderful. So th those are allies on any issue that impacts uh, Iowa. 
Uh, and then, uh, be, you know, beyond that, uh, it just depends on what the issue is. Sure. Because uh, because our work's done in committees, mm -hmm. and so uh, you know, it depends what the bill is and which committee it's coming from. Uh, you know, I know people on, on every every committee anymore, so sure. uh, uh, it just depends. I don't have any key yeah. allies. You know, I know people. Uh, you know, I know the speaker well, Paul mm -hmm. Ryan and uh, Leader McCarthy and Whip Scalise and uh, Kevin Brady. From Texas is chair of the Ways and Means Committee, very mm -hmm. powerful committee. We get along wonderfully. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Jeb Hensterling's chair of the Financial Services Committee. Trey Gowdy and I have gotten to be friends uh, oh, on good. the Oversight Committee. Yeah, uh, yeah you just uh, you just work with these people in committees and you get to know each other sure. uh, better. So uh, I'd say I have. I have lots of allies, and I know lots of the Democrats as well. I think you've mentioned in the past that, that you and uh, and Thomas Massey are, are friendly. So I, I was wondering if uh, if you you two have anything planned in the future. Yeah, we have. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, Massey's on uh, third floor of Cannon mm -hmm. Cannon House office building. Uh, his office is three three one four, and uh, I'm two one three. So yeah. I'm pretty much right underneath him, and then yeah. right underneath me in Cannon is uh, Justin Amash. Oh, there, there so, you go. So uh, we, we, you know, we're lined up pretty much on three floors uh, above yeah, and below sure. each other. So we're, we call ourselves the pillar of liberty uh, <laughs> in, in Congress. And uh, it's just kind of kind of cool how that all worked out. But uh, yeah. yeah, Thomas Massey and I have gotten to be very, very good friends. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Justin Amash as well. But I've probably gotten to know Thomas uh, better. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he's a great guy, very smart guy, uh, MIT grad, and uh, but a fellow businessman. So, uh, you know, yeah. we hit it off immediately. His friendship and mine will last beyond Congress. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind. So I really enjoy Thomas. Uh, he's yeah. always got a smile on his face. And he's always got a unique perspective yeah. on uh, whatever it may be in Congress. And uh, if I'm having a bad day, you know, I see Thomas Massey. Guy, he makes me <laughs> smile. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, that's, he, that's he, good Justin, he and Justin are uh, obviously uh, champions of, of liberty. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's always good to get their perspective on. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll talk to them often about their take on bills. Would, would you put yourself in that category as well? Do you think there's uh, any chance you would ever join the House Liberty Caucus? Uh, oh, sure. Sure, there's a chance I would. Uh, yeah, I, I, I consider myself, uh, you know, a champion for, for freedom, yeah. for liberty. Uh, there's no doubt. Uh, and I think the government uh, every day uh, takes away, chips away at our, at, our, at our Bill of Rights, chips away at our freedom, chips away at, at liberty. And uh, I hate to see that. And, uh, you know, I've been uh, allies uh, of Justin and uh, Thomas on, uh, like, the uh, the uh, it, the uh, reauthorization of the Freedom Act. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a no vote on that because uh, I, I'm, I'm, a real, I'm a real stickler on making sure that the government's not spying on us. Yeah. And so we try to limit that, as uh, the three of us do, as much as, as, much as possible. Absolutely. And uh, that, that act... Uh, uh, it, it didn't allow for the NSA to store metadata, uh, you know, on government computers. So that was a good thing. But it also mm -hmm. uh, it allowed uh, a warrantless, warrantless searches of your communications. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could get a warrant seven days later. Yeah. I mean, that's to me not constitutional. <laughs> and then it also lowered the, uh, the bar uh, to get a warrant, for mm -hmm. example, from probable cause, which is right in the Constitution, to reasonable suspicion. And uh, yeah. just to be able to say, you know, I can search somebody without a warrant because I get seven days here. I can search somebody's cell phone records because I have a reasonable suspicion they might be doing a terrorist activity. No, it's not good yeah. enough. So uh, I was a no vote along with uh, Amash and Massey mm -hmm. on bills like that. So I'm very concerned about uh, privacy issues when sure. it comes to our government. Yeah, no, that would, uh, that would open the door for all sorts of, you know, misuse and uh, abuse of the system, wouldn't it? Oh, yes, I mean, yes. And, 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 you know, I think it was... Uh, I think it was Franklin, maybe, that said, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that that people willing to give up their liberty and their freedom and to trade it for security shall sure. shall have neither and deserve neither. And, uh, you know, I couldn't agree more. I always say this is America. We should be able to have our liberty and freedoms protected and have mm -hmm. security both. Uh, Ab but so, so many people are willing to trade in their uh, liberties and freedoms for, you know, this promise mm -hmm. of we'll keep you safe if, if we if we can just spy on you. Yeah. And I totally do not agree with that. Um, building on that, you uh, you worked on a major uh, uh, whistleblower protection bill, didn't you? Yes. Would you go over yes. uh, some of the major features of that? Yes, and it passed in the House, and uh, it's stalled in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Ron Johnson, uh, who got reelected, that's good news. It's in his committee. So uh, when I get back on Monday, I'm going to find out where that's at. Hopefully it can make sure. it into the omnibus. But what it did is it renewed the uh, Whistleblower Act and strengthened uh, the Office of Special Counsel. Uh, who are assigned to federal employees who whistleblow mm -hmm. to protect them. 
And uh, we need more whistleblowers in the federal yeah. government, not less. And people will not come forward and tell us when things are being done incorrectly or maybe even illegally in some cases. They won't come forward if they feel like they're going to be terminated or punished. Sure. So we need to make sure as a government we protect anybody that comes forward and, and, and is a whistleblower. So my, my bill would strengthen mm -hmm. uh, the Whistleblower Act, reauthorize it, and reauthorize uh, the Office of Special Counsel. Uh, so... I'm hopeful it'll make it in the omnibus, and if not, uh, we'll reintroduce it and go at it again next session. Sure. But uh, we need more whistleblowers, not fewer. You just look at the VA system yeah. and the abuses in the VA system of oh, some yeah. of our veterans. And uh, some of the whistleblowers that have come forward in the VA system across the country have been punished, terminated, reassigned. Yeah. I mean, that's just not right, and we yeah. can't have people fearing that. Absolutely. So that would uh, that would just offer protections to, to people who... Uh, found uh you know abuses in the system or illegal activity or or what's the criteria that they would have to meet to uh get that protection yeah exactly yeah that's okay. exactly so right. it is illegal. okay they come forward and say there's an abuse there's mm -hmm. uh uh you know i mean it's you, know, you get down to the lower level it's like well i don't think we're doing this right sure. that's not really doesn't come to the level of a whistleblower yeah. but they say you know we're doing something illegal we're doing something against the law mm -hmm. or we're uh you know uh there was a there was a guy that worked in the va kitchen in philadelphia at a VA hospital, and he said he went, came forward and said we have an infestation of insects in the kitchen, you know. And uh, he was he was reassigned to the morgue. He really was wow. reassigned to morgue duty because he did that. Now it's just like you know, yeah. I guess it's not illegal to have an infestation, but it is breaking codes, it's yeah. breaking regulations. And sure. It's like we need more of that, not less of that in the government. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, this is a little change of topic, but a, a lot of conservatives would uh, probably lament the dis the destruction of our military. Um, despite the fact that we spend a lot more on military than, than most of the, any other countries in the world, do you think that in order to improve our military, we'll have to expand our military budget? Or do you think that reallocation of, of resources and, and priorities would, would get the job done uh, just fine? Well, the military has taken it on the chin uh, mm -hmm. since we, we had the, uh, the sequestration and the budget, and the, uh, and sure. the budget caps. I know a lot of people have issues with the sequestration bills and such. Yes, yeah, so it. Uh, I mean, there's been there's been actual reductions in our military, mm -hmm. and I think we'd all agree the world is probably as less safe as it's ever been. And uh, so uh, the military uh, budget has really been hit. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll be the first to say, is there waste in the military? Mm -hmm. Well, of course there is. There's mm -hmm. waste in uh, every government agency. Yeah. And as a business person, uh, I you know I. I can see that maybe a little bit easier than some of the professional Pro bureaucrats. probably just eats at you, doesn't it? So I mean, the you know the, the defense department needs to be as efficient as they possibly can be, obviously. Uh, but you know, defense is always tough mm -hmm. because uh, uh, you know the legislators there in Congress, uh, we're we're not defense, we're not we're not generals sure. in the military, and uh, you know we need to be able to uh, execute two wars at the same mm -hmm. time. Is our is our standard uh, at at different places in the world. And, uh, you know, I think I've, I've talked, I spoke to the generals. Uh, we're reaching the point where that's becoming somewhat iffy if we can execute two wars at the same time. So uh, we cannot uh, fall below that standard. And, uh, you know, it's uh, technology uh, is, is our friend, you know, for, for our sure. defense department, uh, but it's not cheap. Yeah. So we need to, uh, freedom's not cheap. Yeah. So we need to take care of our veterans mm -hmm. who uh, have secured our freedom for us. Some of them have paid the ultimate sacrifice. And uh, we need to make those investments uh, in technology, particularly uh, in the military, and not and not, not be building uh, outdated tanks, yeah. not be building outdated uh, things uh, to fight a, to fight war we, the way we used to 50 years ago. I mean, things have changed so much. Sure. I mean, a lot of the warfare now is going to be cyber warfare, yeah. and our systems hacked into, and we saw that with WikiLeaks. Uh, so I mean, uh, so if, when we talk about warfare now, it's changed so much. Now we have uh, terrorism and guerrilla warfare that are fought in urban streets of distant cities, okay, that's a different type of war than World War II. Sure. And yeah. also now we have cyber war with computers and databases and computing in the cloud. So, you know, it's like what we're spending the money on, we need to be modernized. Mm -hmm. uh, in the so, you, uh, so you think that we should spend a lot more on, on resources to combat cyber terrorism? Oh, uh, yes, mm -hmm. on cyber terrorism, correct. Sure. But doesn't mean doesn't mean it has to be an overall budget increase. I mean, we can, right. uh, you know, should we be building a tank? Mm -hmm. I don't know how often tanks are used in warfare anymore yeah. versus... You know, adding uh, additional brilliant minds mm -hmm. uh, to fight cyber, cyber terrorism. Sure. Yeah. So that's a good question. So, so you would say there's a that we need reallocation of some resources, and and uh, 
and such, right? Possibly. I'm not. See, okay. I'm not on the military committee. Sure. And, sure. Uh, so uh, armed services, I'm not on that committee. That's where the detail work gets done. Sure. And I don't pretend to be a military expert. Mm -hmm. So I just look at the top line of the military mm -hmm. budget and taking care of our veterans. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure we take care of our veterans, Absolutely. honor the promises that we made to them. And, uh, and, and once again, military has, uh, the military has taken the brunt of the sequestration cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it'll, it'll be great to have President-elect Trump in there. And I like to see him do a, a, a military review top to bottom. Mm -hmm. But let's modernize it as well. So do you think that you would support, uh, if it came up in Congress, an audit of the Pentagon or the military? Well, it should be audited every year. Yeah. And because uh, uh, I, I know that now GSA uh, that does the audits, general services, accounting uh, in uh, the government, they said it's it's so messed up they can't audit it. Yeah, and that's what they I was can't say. audit it. Yeah. Now that's that's bad. I mean, every every big every major corporation out there that's public is audited every year, mm -hmm. every year. I mean, so certainly the government that's spending four trillion dollars of taxpayer yeah. money, every agency <laughs> should be audited every year. And they say they can't audit uh, the Defense Department. That's an issue mm -hmm. that needs a change. Defense Department needs to be audited. Going back to uh, some of the House procedural processes, you know, I've heard um, some rumblings that that a lot of the honeymoon period with you know House Speaker Paul Ryan might be uh, might be coming to an end for a lot of conservatives. Um, so roughly a year after Ryan's taken the Speaker's gavel, how do you think you would rate his performance as leader of the House GOP? Oh, I think it's a tough job. Uh, sure. There's no doubt. It's like uh, I said, it's like uh, herd, herding 435 cats. Mm -hmm. Try doing that, <laughs> you know, and every every person in the House. Uh, for the most part, these are, these are bright people. Mm -hmm. and they know the issues, and uh, they each have a vision for the country, just like I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, no two visions probably match. So it's, it's not an easy job. And uh, I think things will be much better. Uh, they got they got much better under Paul Ryan than uh, John Boehner. Sure. Uh, that was he, Paul's a breath of fresh air, and he gave us all a voice and let mm -hmm. our voices be heard. And uh, under under the former speaker, is very top down very authoritarian type of management style. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we need to be more of a bottom-up organization. That's and so uh, Speaker Ryan has set a lot of those types of things in, in action. So that's good. And I think he'll be he'll be more effective and will be more effective now that we have the White House. Mm -hmm. And the leadership oh, yeah. will come from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And uh, President-elect Trump will set the agenda and say, I want these things done. Mm -hmm. And then we'll set to go to work uh, on producing those things for him. Totally different. Yeah. than having uh, Barack Obama in the White House. And what we're doing is playing a lot of defense. Yeah. What would you consider some of his, uh, Paul Ryan's, that is, better accomplishments? And, and what do you think are some areas that he could probably improve as Speaker? Oh, I just said his biggest accomplishment is we all had a voice mm -hmm. and have a voice. Uh, and he set up uh, six working committees to mm -hmm. come up with a better dot GOP. You may have heard about that. Sure. And uh, one is welfare reform, one is uh, health care reform, uh, one is uh, get the economy, reignite the economy. Uh, six, six different areas. And uh, we, we could participate in every committee or we could participate in none. It was up to us. Uh, so that was wonderful. And we had numerous, numerous meetings each committee did. So we could uh, show up and give our input. And this is wonderful uh, that, that some of my ideas went into the welfare Mm -hmm. reform uh, package or ideas, if you will. And that's a, that's a good feeling. So, the, I mean, the most best thing he's done is uh, bottom up, is let let all of us have a voice again. And, uh, I mean, he's, he's a Wisconsin guy. And so you cannot not like Paul Ryan personally. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's a good mm -hmm. guy. And uh, uh, so that, that's been a breath of fresh air. You know, it's not an easy job. Uh, what we all can do better, hopefully with President Trump's uh, leadership, is uh, do the 12 appropriations bills. Sure. And the way it should be done. And but you know the House, in the last uh, in this session, the last two years, we passed over five hundred bills, and they've been a lot of them have been good bills. Yeah. But they they die in the Senate, because uh, Harry Reid just uh, blocked blocked things yeah. for the president, so it never made it to his desk, because of the filibuster rule. It takes sixty senators to move anything, and now we're still we're still in that situation. Mm -hmm. uh, they can still filibuster any law worse. that they want. Yeah, it's even worse because there's only 51 Republican senators now. You know, it's like we passed a lot of bills. We did a lot of work the House has over the last two years that mm -hmm. you don't hear about because most of it didn't become law. Sure. Because yeah. it never made it to the president's <laughs> desk. Not that he probably would have signed most of them anyway. Yeah. But we did pass an Education Act. We did pass uh, a highway transportation or surface transportation bill. And, uh, you know, we, we, we did some good things there uh, in the last two years, considering how divided it all was.
Last question here. Um, with a lot of committee positions and seniority still being so central and bringing a lot of legislation to the floor where a lot of these bills just end up dying in committee, um, do you think that you and the Freedom Caucus would plan on pushing for more procedural uh, reforms to the way that Congress operates? And uh, what are some procedural changes you'd like to see be, be made still? Yeah, see, I'm not sure. I've been uh, I've been gone for, I, I, I you know, the Freedom Caucus has held a couple meetings uh, sure. telephonically. Uh, since I've been back in Iowa, that I haven't had time to participate in. So I don't know what they're where they're at, but I'm sure they're probably uh, looking at procedural changes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure which ones though. Uh, but I know one that sounds sounds like it has appeal to me is uh, letting letting the committees pick who their chair is, versus having sure. leadership pick who the chair yeah. of the committee is. That makes sense. I mean, to me. that would just make sense. Bottom up again. That's bottom up again. This is all inside baseball stuff. I mean, yeah. every citizen doesn't care about this. But uh, oh, well, I'm an, I'm a nerd, so don't worry about that. <laughs> so you know, let let the committee. The members of the committee pick who their chair is, mm -hmm. and uh, leadership today picks who the chair is. So I think that I think that'd be a good change. I think that has merit. I like to listen. I like to listen to their side, yeah. see why they say it doesn't have merit. Uh, but on the surface, you know, in Washington D.C., the committee's leadership—it's a lot of it's seniority based. Yeah. How long you have been there, and uh, you know, I don't know how we change that. But personally, as something, uh, you know, people like myself who have, are accomplished outside of government. I mean, uh, I'd like to be able to say, you know, um, I've grown businesses, I've taken them public, I've spent 30 years in the private sector. Does that count for seniority? Yeah. You know, why does it have to be seniority in, in the federal government? Right. Seniority in screwing things up. <laughs> seniority in spending ourselves to bankruptcy. Seniority in taking away our liberty and freedom. Well, why should that count more than somebody who has mm -hmm. taken a com company from two employees to 325 employees? You know, so I, I, I would like to, I like to, you know, this whole seniority system uh, you know, I, I don't know how we do it exactly, but I like to see it go away and uh, let people let. I, I like fresh ideas. I like fresh blood. That's why I believe in term limits. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely convinced we need term limits. And uh, we, one of the first things we'll do is re, reintroduce a bill uh, for a constitutional amendment for term limits as soon as we get back. Sounds good. Anyway, everybody, this has been Congressman Rod Blum. Subscribe to the Liberty Mill on YouTube and Facebook. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much, Congressman. Sure. Really yep. appreciate it. Yep. Hey everybody, it's Timothy here as always. I know it's been a little while since I posted my last video, and in fact, this interview with Rod Blum was recorded about a month ago. It's taken a little while to get up, mostly because I've been working on a brand new show concept that I think that you guys are going to be really happy about, and I think especially people who are really into political documentaries or books are going to enjoy it quite a bit. If you haven't read it already, I would encourage you to read the book The Declaration of Independence by Nick Gillespie and Matt Welch. More info is coming tomorrow, so stay tuned. Thanks so much for watching my latest video. Be sure to give it a thumbs up and a like on YouTube and Facebook and share it with your friends on social media to help get the word out. Also, if you want to make sure that you never miss another video, you can subscribe to my YouTube or like my Facebook page and get new video notifications by clicking that little bell on YouTube or by hovering over the like button on Facebook. Thanks again. Sure, you're doing a good job. You're out there working, asking, <laughs> asking the tough questions in the back seats of SUVs. <laughs> That's I right. Mean, you know, the major media is never going to do that.